three. Yo, what's good? Welcome to Counter Currents. This is your host, Petey Steele. And I'm your co-host, Selena Torres. And today's guest, uh, she's a comedian that's absolutely killing it right now. She just had something come out on Comedy Central. But for me, she has an extra special meaning because she hosted the first mic I ever did. And mm. she was nice enough where she asked me, like, but like, you know, right before you get on stage, whenever she asked me, do you want me to tell the audience that this is your first time? And I said, yes. And then I said, no, I think I changed my mind like six times. And she was very patient and cool about it. And I'm forever grateful. Please welcome the amazingly talented Brittany Carney. Hello. Thank you for having me. Ellie, I didn't, I, I didn't remember that until now. Like, I feel like I Thanks for coming on. I bet was that a wonderland you do i was gonna ask you if you remember that it was that wonderland yeah um oh my gosh wow yeah. uh that's so exciting it's good to talk to you again now I'm eons later mm -hmm. and yeah um thanks guys for having me on i'm excited to hear hear from you here with you yeah 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 you were in, you in were... new york been dominating everything we've seen on uh you know media uh -oh. um i was sad i went up there maybe two augusts ago uh just me and my mother on kind of a mother-son trip and we went to the comedy cellar one night just to catch a oh, yeah. show and oh yeah my friend Brittany might be on the bill but you weren't on that night uh, no um, yeah okay that's really that's really cool i'm sorry i missed you also i just remembered something Petey, were you somehow in Chicago like a weekend that Benji and I were there? Absolutely. And you yeah. saw them? I wasn't with you. I didn't see you. Yeah. No, I um, went up there and it was so funny because it was my friend Kristen Toomey, who's a great comic out of Chicago. And I went up there to visit with her and also just go around, do mics or whatever. So after we hung out one day, she's like, oh, yeah, come do the Laugh Factory. I can get you in there. And then I get up there, and I'm there early. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's comics coming from D.C. Like Benji's on the list. And then Bassam shows up, and he says, oh, yeah, you know, I might get on, too. He didn't eventually get off. He's like, Brittany might be coming. And I was like, oh, cool. But I didn't run into you then. But me and Benji went up and did the town. It was great. That's so crazy. I remember at the time being, like, really – taken by the small world aspect of that and I forgot what was going on I guess maybe I just had a show somewhere else but I was like what the fuck how's everybody convening in this it was like a random week it must have been June 2019 July 4th it was the July oh, yes 4th. no it was you're right it was later um and then that reminds me Elena you were talking about like how we first met at when you perf were performing at Wonderland I remember the first host like the first, the host for my first open mic was David Carter, but then I remember that early on, Benji was hosting an open mic at Capital Lounge, rest in power. <laughs> um, <that's> a, <laughs> it was the bar next to the Heritage Foundation. But anyway, I remember that like Benji was hosting and then he was like, hey, is your name Carmela? And what? my name is not. <laughs> my last name is Carney. I guess it just sort of <laughs> came up with the sound. <laughs> anyway. And then we became the greatest of enemies. Um, no, uh, anyway, cool. Great to connect. Yeah, it's funny. It's, it, it's funny how suddenly, you know, you feel like you you haven't done comedy for that long, but suddenly, at least I do. Like, I feel like it hasn't been that long, but then suddenly you have all these memories that to you feel of what happened yesterday. Yeah, it's like, actually oh. kind of, it's both unsettling and then I guess cause to feel proud of yourself, right? Because you remember early days. And I don't know, it all just kind of mushed together. Totally. And you but, you moved to New York how long ago? A year ago? Yeah, a little bit over, over a year. When did I move? I moved in November of 2018. Yeah, I, met, I, removed, I moved the day before Thanksgiving in November. And the reason really was because oh, I, for about a year, I had been going up to coming up here to New York more frequently to do different shows. And then that was like getting better you know, that was getting maybe more, <laughs> less, uh, what's, how should I say this? Less soul, soul sinking, like with each month I would go and it was really right. helpful to make more connections the more I went. And then through that 
through the previous year, I um, signed with representation out of New York and I was working a day job in DC that was like, it was like a research contract job for one of the Smithsonian sites and it was ending pretty concretely in that October. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to hike up my bags and go. So um, now it's a little bit over two years, I guess, which feels and bizarre. What was, that, what was that process like? Because we all know a lot of people who have moved to New York, but you're one of the people that I've seen that's comedically done really well pretty quickly. Um, I feel there. really How grateful. Well? And I feel so grateful that things worked okay or like uh, and I but that doesn't mean that when I first got there for the first month I was like really I mean I was very lucky right to like be able to go up and have some connections but then I also felt really it was still really hard like I felt very lonely I definitely missed the comfort of the DC scene I felt excited that like when I did get to do a show things were um it seemed I, I, I honestly and having thought about all of this and reflection it really helps if you can like when you go like I would do older stuff at open mics just to do and the whole open mic scene in New York is like really tough because there's a bazillion and they tend to be like a bucket where you like pull a name out of a bucket but it's pretty rigged so <laughs> as and some and like as often like a new person I would be last and there would be like three comics left but then I realized that if you just really try to bring it for them and you like do well then they're like oh okay cool and then that builds from there and then mm -hmm. I'd also been able to do like um exciting shows prior to that but then the problem that I found when I first got there at least in terms of like getting stage time is that I was really lucky enough and through like seeing places like the DC Improv or Big Hunt where you get to meet New York comics like through these little opportunities I'd mm -hmm. had really helpful like connections right with comics who were doing really well and then mm -hmm. And then, but then there was like no middle, like a, what do you call it? So I had this like cushy kind of ceiling, but then I still had to get stage time every night. And that I realized quickly was going to take a lot of work. And so at the time my manager said that I had the, I, uh, and it was like totally a time where I was still like crying and <laughs> lonely. Right. And, I, and she said that you have champagne problems. And then she was like, I think that you just have to trust that soon it'll be a lot better. And honestly, um, I didn't really have much else going on. So I got to put a lot of energy. <laughs> right. Uh, so I, I would say, I remember thinking that with each month I felt a bit more connected and like trusted comedically, right? And like every, it's like every show is like, like you have to make a new impression. And then I honestly feel like it was all kind of working out right as COVID hit, but um, like, mm -hmm. I, or I got into more, of a steady feeling. Mm -hmm. And when you say, when you talk about like the cushy part versus the not, like what's that picture look like? By cushy, I'm assuming you mean that like here, you know, where like I'm at the stage two and PD is two, where we're like opening for comics and large theaters, yeah. you know, and people who are, who are successful, who have TV deals or whatever. So you have that connection, but you can't go straight from like, hey, I'm new in town to that, right? Is that what you mean? Is yeah. like a issue problem and the getting, talk about like that right. so a little bit. So it's like, I knew people who were like well-known and really mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. And they were always welcoming to me when I was in their space. And then I would go to these open mics that were really tough where nobody knew me because those people aren't um, featuring at the DC Improv, you know, they're like just figuring out comedy in this huge, like sprawling comedy scene. So right. those people really obviously didn't give much of like a fuck about me. And I understand that. So I would say, and so then, okay, so then, and, and, and I have two points, like, so I felt really encouraged because I was like, okay, I can get on some of these bigger shows and do really well. But in the meantime, I also have to like figure out the open mics or like the heart, like the kind of more like, like the bar shows that happen and there's like three people, you know, and right, right. I do think that's all important because as you guys know, like momentum is key, right? For yeah. just like remembering <laughs> who you are as a comic and person. And um, so for example, through some helpful connections, I got to do like some bigger shows in New York where I got to be seen by other like comedians who I really admired. And then those came Oh, sort of like here and there maybe more increasingly enough to the extent that I felt more confident in like like the 
tough open mic circuits. And I remember that there was one week where I was like, okay, Brittany, your rule for this week is to go to one open mic a night. And like, there's so many, so people can really stack them up. And, and then, right. and I went to, and it was like this freezing night. <laughs> and I think it was like January, December. And I went to this open mic that was in a pizza shop that's now closed and like somewhere in lower Manhattan. And, you know, I went last and I remember thinking that, and everybody was like, they all knew each other, which you guys are also familiar with, like that feeling in DC when you enter a comedy space and you're like familiar, everyone's your friend, right? Okay. And I realized like, oh, they had that. And I don't know, it was kind of a, like, it was relatively a nightmare, but I guess I also felt kind of comforted in the fact that, oh, they're all friends. They, they knew each other. I just have to like keep showing up. But then I actually didn't even, but then that week I like didn't um, uh, like own up to my goal. But I remember that that pizza, pizza day was like kind of a turning point in just feeling like uh, I could stick it through. And I remember maybe two weeks after I moved, Michael Summers, who's a uh, very funny DC comic and friend, he and I started within weeks of each other. He um, was in New York for something and we got a beer and I was like really down. And I'm sure I was like not a encouraging uh, presence for anyone considering moving to New York. Right. But then I don't know with each step and like definitely the seller was so helpful that that worked out so um yeah it was like a really ass-kicking first year but I really think that if you're moving to New York for comedy and you just really 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 try hard then it all gets a lot easier because people know who you are right and, and you talk about like moments with comedians you really admire and stuff what was a moment where somebody came up to you that you were kind of like, like not starstruck, but sort of like, oh my God, I can't believe this person said I was funny. Like, yeah, what? Um, that happened a few times. And that was, I'm so grateful for the little experiences because, you know, comedy's hard and coming to a new scene is hard. So when you get that kind of support, it really means the world. Like I, um, let me think, relatively early on, I was on Butterboy, which is a really fun show in Brooklyn. And David Cross was on it. And he was like really cool to me about my set he was really helpful and supportive and like said really nice things and that was definitely a time where I was still um just like like you know like just figuring out how to get booked every week right and then right. um or people who I'd seen kill at DC rooms but they were just like in town for a little bit from New York and mm -hmm. then they were really familiar or encouraging but then one really notable memory for me is um so uh okay I got I got I got passed at the cellar in July of 2019 so I guess I was in New York for about um like eight months and you know it's hard there it's obviously really exciting but it's still like as a, you definitely feel like a noob and there's not that many young women and you have to like really fight to feel confident and make sure that you're like performing really well and killing to the best of your ability in a new uh, intimidating place and mm -hmm. I really love Gary Goldman and had for years and I didn't I didn't think he like knew obviously who I was I was just one of the like the new crop of, of little babies right. that were right. and one day um yeah one day uh he sat down it was like the table in the village underground. And then I, and I, and I would like, I was just kind of nervously looking through a notebook and he sat down and I smiled politely and I said, hi. Cause I was like, I'm sure he doesn't want me to talk to him. And he was like, right. um, said, hi. And he said, hi, Brittany Carney. And I remember thinking like, <laughs> wow. oh, <laughs> hi, hi Gary. And then, yeah. And I guess the thing is like, if you're working in that kind of environment and you've been doing it for a while, if you liked a new comic coming through, then you pay attention. And I kind of realized that quickly, you know, like um, and he, he would like, but other moments would surprise me by like being really effusive or encouraging after a set of mine. And I just usually think like no one cares. And yeah. you guys are too, like, I don't know, it's hard to watch your friends all the time. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that happens, especially like when you're in this scene for so long. And I think this, I think it, what it's what makes comedians comedians. Like, I think part of us, at least, I don't know, tell me if you feel this way, but part of us thinks that no one's listening. So we can say all the stuff that we say because we're like, no one cares. Yeah. That's and so true. actually the words that we're saying are a lot more powerful than I think we realize, but I think you have to have a little bit of that, like, no one's listening yeah. to be able to do this right that that comes as a, always a big a big shock um <laughs> a big, yeah but uh yeah so I think that like um I don't know I feel really lucky that it was working in New York and I guess relatively still is even though I feel like most days I I forgot I forget what comedy itself is but yeah. anyway I yeah yeah um, there, there have been a lot this is a comedy podcast there have been a lot of moments like that in our episodes on zoom lately where comedians at all levels kind of go into that like space out thing yeah like, you're like who uh, am i yeah oh wait is that peter, peter yeah oh, okay <laughs> yeah. so so like alien robot voice serving i um i like yeah okay so I think that recently, especially with COVID, I, I think like this was the case in DC, like in New York, honestly, the comedy that was outside was like thriving pretty well to an extent that I was really pleasantly surprised by. I was like, oh, I guess comedy is still going to, like, it's gonna happen. It's New York, comedians are all like j like jittery and, ang and angsty in their homes and then, I remember people talking about like being feeling really concerned about um, how comedy, like live comedy would look once it got cold. And all summer this year, I was like, yeah, whatever, like come, it's gonna happen. Okay, like, come on. It's like, like uh, people are gonna come out with their coats, like comics are gonna come out like um, with earmuffs, like comedy is gonna thrive. Like we're all little creatures that are looking for the light source. And actually, and then I think there was like one October um show on a roof that was like really cold like the first really cold weekend and I was like okay no <laughs> <It's really> yeah. hard. <laughs> it's hard I can't feel my fingers <laughs> yeah. yeah I think I think uh I think we all had that same sort of blind optimism for for a long time and I was like the winter might get weird but it'll be no time and now that we're in it it's like oh my god yeah. yeah even when it works it doesn't work remember ramin set up that one in virginia that was really good it was like on a backdoor deck that oh, were cool. heat, facing everything good crowd and then football began and the place is like we don't care that you filled the deck fuck off you know oh yeah, yeah 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 but then also you know and i also think like as soon as that weather got like it, it's like like you said Brittany, in october as soon as that weather just got a little shitty it's just like this and you actually feel it you're like this is never gonna work yeah so um i i guess i don't know maybe you also feel like cycles of this where i, I i'm like i'll miss stand up very much mm -hmm. or like i'll miss the hustle and bustle of it and also because i'm so grateful for this even though i have a, another day job i'm i was like so happy that i was getting to a point where i was like oh i'm making supplemental income from comedy this feels like a dream come true that i didn't expect would happen that early in right. coming here and then that doesn't really exist <laughs> right now obviously right. so even though comedy is like relative uh, live comedy is slowed down but i also don't hate the break from running around every night i think i have a whole streak of gray hair that i like by the way but it's like from <laughs> just my first year trying to do comedy <laughs> in new york <laughs> and um you know yeah so yeah, yeah I know, I really... it's great i'd like a break, you know it'd been a long time coming for me in terms of like you know i'm not some spring chicken either i'm about to be 40 in a few months and it's tiresome to do all the late nights and everything like that you know and then get up at six every 5 45 every day and then log in because i do work you know yeah uh, yeah, but I, I I worry sometimes like shit that I forget to do how to do some of this. But yeah. then the couple times I've been out, it's come back autopilot. So I'm like, man, eh, a break's not all that bad. Like a bicycle. Yeah. yeah. Back, 
that's how I felt about it in the beginning. Cause in the beginning I made the huge mistake that I started going back to comedy like way too quick after having a baby. Oh yeah. And because, yeah. because how old I is your child baby. now? Hmm? How old is your child now? She's 13 months. Oh my God. That's so yeah, exciting. It's over a year old. And I started, I went back to comedy five weeks later. <gasps> really? Wow. Yeah, I wasn't going to, but I got, I got a Incredible. call from Draft House being like, hey, somebody dropped out. Can you fill in? And I just couldn't say no. Yeah. It bombed How- my face off. I did so bad because I was like so hormonal and such a mess. And then <laughs> you know what it's like when you bomb, you're like, well, I have to fix this now. And then I just went right and back to like comedy full on after well, you're a superhero. I, w- I was not, I was really <laughs> exhausted and not a super. So when COVID first came, I was like, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> like I was not ready for that. Especially it's, like just mentally, because hormonally I was, I was all over the place. Like they talk about postpartum depression. They don't talk about <sighs> just like postpartum crazy. Um, oh my gosh. I can only imagine. I was all over the place. That first break, the first break I loved. Cause I was like, okay, I can like really recover and I don't feel like I'm missing out. And then the outdoor shows happened for me, like right at a point where I felt like I was ready to go back. Oh, that's amazing. So, so this then- time it feels like much more traumatic than last. Like when this winter came for me, it feels much more like, oh no, than it did in the beginning. Like, I feel like now I'm feeling what everybody felt months um, earlier. And yeah, I know. It's so, what an, you know what, you know what else I've been thinking about too? Like in addition to how actually physically and emotionally and mentally exhausting live comedy is and you like don't really realize it because you're experiencing the high of like jumping around to rooms and seeing your friends and um is uh that wait I lost my train of thought okay we were talking about tired being tired we're talking about comedy um uh the exhausting part of going from room to room every night um what did I what was I thinking about with relation oh okay I'm really nostalgic right now because it's cold for how good winter is for stand-up you know like yeah, in winter so audiences are hot they want to like cuddle up in these dark gross basements and that's so it's, it's so non-covid compliant it's the yep. best season it's the best season for stand-up always like the colder the better because it's one of the few indoor activities you can do yeah i know so we'll see how it happens i i feel like i have a lot of oh but yeah i'm actually coming to uh What's, what's it called? There's a venue in Leesburg that works in conjunction with the improv yep. in DC. Um, oh, yeah, Tally Ho Theater. That yeah, one? I'm going there at the end of this month. Uh, oh, so I'm curious about it. Like, is it indoor or outdoor? It's indoor. It's I, a indoor, but it's a very big space. I did cool. it about a few years back for Liz Mealy. And oh, you, sweet. You have like a huge ceiling, they'll space it out really well. It's a great venue. You should be fine. Stage is kind of high too. Okay, cool. probably like, it probably feels a lot like doing shows at Arlington now. Oh, yeah, way, that makes sense. That's okay, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's really cool. I, I, I like. Uh, so yeah, anyway, I'm looking forward to that. But I totally feel like uh, it's hard not to feel rusty. But I do think actually there's a, like a weird muscle memory that comes back eventually when you get back to, into doing comedy and. Um, like it's nice to get opportunities like that when it feels like the whole world is hibernating you know yeah um like I was excited so like my comedy central set that came out I didn't expect or like that show I didn't expect to get anything like that in a pandemic I was feeling encouraged that like this time last year I was like okay I'm gonna have a productive year in New York and then everything closed but like that was um that's a pretty productive thing to have I I think at at any year let alone a pandemic year which by the way you guys should check out Britney's Comedy Central set that just came out it's a great it's a great set oh thank you but I definitely going into it myself and the other and and, yeah I'm proud of I'm so excited for that like that 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 I also love your styling choices. Uh, 
your hair looked great. You looked, Thank you. You look great. You did great. I was very proud of you. Thank you. I wanted to go for like matrix whore and I yeah. feel it worked. So <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, I, it was really, for me, that really worked. I love that. I actually sent my outfit like ideas to a few uh, female comics in DC that I'm close to <laughs> like yeah. so that they could so they had you know I, I had different costume changes the day of and um yeah they had us like oh yeah they had us quarantine for a week and get tested twice um in order to do the show and all the crew were and then the point is that like going into it I definitely felt kind of like an alien and some of the other comics too were like I haven't done this in months <laughs> but right. um yeah, I don't know. I guess it kind of comes back. So, yeah, uh, yeah. You, I mean, you did Graham, and I'm not just because it's a podcast. Like, you did really well, and I had no idea that you hadn't done it. In, in oh, however thank you. Long. That really means a lot. Um, I, uh, it's interesting and like funny. It's because I would say that for me, absolutely, that is the first time that I have something on a more public platform. So right. just the number of mean comments is like really a learning experience and oh, yeah. funny. Yeah. And like, I, I felt both like, like I wanted to cry and enraged and like really amused and like empowered by all these <laughs> really, honestly, like uh, hilariously mean comments. And um, so that was like, that was, uh, yeah, that's uh, the worst part. The worst part with the mean ones is if you feel like they're kind of right. Like you read it and you're like, I, I could see how you could say I look that way. That's the worst so part. true. And then, um, yeah. And then, yeah. And so that was, so it was, last week was kind of a roller coaster week because I had been looking forward to that coming out for a while and I was like feeling proud of it. Or I'd actually gone through cycles of like being worried how it was going to come out. But in the moment, I had a lot of fun and it really did feel amazing to do live comedy in like this organized structure right and so um it, given what the world is going through so anyway last week I was really I was like physically oh my god the day that it came out I was so sweaty I was really sweating through my turtleneck that I I felt like I was just like walking around in this puddle of my own sweat because like then I was like what like a whore in the matrix yeah <laughs> yes uh, <laughs> in the corporal world so out of the matrix algorithm but I was really sweaty and then I like started seeing all the mean comments and really cycled through all kinds of emotions that day about like wanting to troll them back like feeling like they were right and then being like this is so silly I don't really have interest in trying to appeal to people who are going to respond this way but right. I, I I did have this like little girl feeling deep inside, which was like, but I just want you to like this product that I worked hard on. <laughs> and, and, and then anyway, but then it was fine, and I'm I'm excited that it's out and that I got like um, it's like in, like they got that you know particular set out and like um, then the next day I got really I got like totally uh, zoom heckled for the first time in in like a harsh way. So. Um, the, the universe, <laughs> the universe works in uh, the ways of a f like tricky little mix. Well, I think that's why, I mean, also comedy, I feel like you, you don't get comedians whose egos get that crazy because comedy is the one art form where you're constantly taken down. Like every time oh, you yeah. big up moment, you know, you go to a show and you get heckled on Zoom the next day, but that's just how comedy works. It's like, oh, you think you're cool? Well, here's something. There's yeah you, that you have you to definitely I'm sorry to speak over you <laughs> no, no. um but I I really agree I, I think about that a lot like I think about how the cliche is that we often feel as good as our last set and right. how I also realize that that doesn't go away really <laughs> like at different level like I, people who are really established and famous comedians still I think go through that cycle which yeah. I don't know if that's comforting or <laughs> horrifying but it's just part of it yeah, I think you just, you know, get inured to it over the time, you know. Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing, though, to have it kind of come back because, like, when I got into it, I wasn't that sensitive about how anyone perceived me. And I was like, cool, yeah. this is going to be what keeps me in the game for so long. And then I got better. And then I started getting more sensitive because I had something to lose then. And I was like, what the fuck is oh, going wow. on? Why yeah. am I getting more, like, you know, 
conscious and care what people think and stuff like that. So it's kind of like, I, I think it's like a marathon. I think it kind of comes and goes, you know, but I've thought about that. Like if it comes to a point where I release tapes and there's comments, like I know some agents will tell their comics, like don't even read them. Don't respond to them. Don't look, just keep, put your head down. And I get that perspective. On the other hand, I don't know, maybe like you're saying you could use it as like fuel to like empower yourself. Like I want to like, yeah, or do better or this or that. I, and then Zoom heckling, I think is just hilarious. I that yeah. happened to be at like an improv show. And I was like, come on, dude, you're going to heckle me from a fucking chat bubble. Like I can't even really respond back to you. I'm going to type at you while I'm doing my set. You fucking jack off like this. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, yeah. That's not even like fair. It's just silly. So um, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, the dog howls at a moon. It's no big deal. But the moon howls at a dog. Well, then <laughs> you know, big story. But In fact, that makes me think about how, like, the reason that Zoom heckling is funny is because if somebody heckles in a live show, it's usually not that thought through. They just kind of, like, blurt it out. <laughs> They're, like, right. drunk or feeling feisty. And so they just, like, shout something out. But to type something takes, like, a level of focus. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> once you get to the third <laughs> third letter, there's, like, a, oh. But anyway, should I be doing this? Or, yeah, I should do this. So, anyway, the... The Zoom heckles, what did I got? Oh, I got, uh, somebody was like, oh, oh, I, oh yeah, it was the kumite through the improv. And somebody was like. Yeah, um, that to me. Oh, Fuck really? Kumite. Wow, so they're wiling, the, the commenters. Um, well, yeah, and it's like, it's so the kumite's format is unique too, right? Because it's like these little short entries into each comedian and like that are five minutes, right? And so this guy was like, when will the show start? <laughs> like during my set. Oh, and then God. another person was like, she looks like she's the female Nipsey Hustle, which I think is purely <laughs> because I had some like braid configuration in my hair. I really don't think it had anything to do with like creativity or, or, or like um, heart in his work. So that was really funny. I don't know. If anything, like, internet comments regarding comedy for me like really enforces ideas that like sometimes people are just gonna say sexist or or like vaguely racist stuff and it's really uh like clear when somebody types it out <laughs> yeah well. yeah it's it's uh it's it's interesting to have that stuff in writing sometimes it's like you know it's like you really you really wanted to get that out especially live like when they're looking at you because it's one thing when you have like a social media comment but like while you're talking like that's a that's a lot of hate you gotta have i know it's kind of impressive so yeah. anyway love them hope they're, hope they're doing well yeah. uh, <laughs> uh but anyway it was it was uh of course i'm grateful to get zoom time right uh, in this in this dark and mysterious age right. uh Actually, yeah. I'm feeling, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, you, gonna... you were saying. Oh, no, no, what were you gonna say? No, I was gonna ask you, uh, this age, you were talking about like this age, you have a really interesting background, right? You grew up in Japan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and then we moved to the Philadelphia area when I was in high school. Uh, okay. And my dad grew up in Philly and then like met my mom who's from Japan, they met in Philadelphia area like before I was born. So yeah, my parents, uh, um settled back to the US when I was a teenager. What was that culture shock like? It was really hard. So we had come to the US through a bunch of my childhood in the summers to hang, see, spend time with my cousins. And I like after kindergarten went to American schools in Japan and we lived in Singapore for a bit. So I was like around Americans and I definitely spoke English like an American and I felt generally American or so I thought. But then it was like hard when I first got to my high school in the Philadelphia area, it was just like a big slap in the face. I felt really foreign and alone at a big school. And I had come from a really tiny private international school mm -hmm. where like m not every kid, English was their first language. You know, the instruction was in English, but a lot of kids were like mixed Japanese or from other parts of Asia or something. And then, um, so yeah, it was really hard. And I like spent, it was like kind of a, in some ways it was like a typical like new kid 
in the middle of ninth grade story where I like cry I like ate my mom would pack me sandwiches and I would eat one in the bathroom because I was too shy to go sit near friends in the cafeteria mm-hmm. and I would like have lunches where I was like crying with my the, like the school guidance counselor and so then I, I don't know I guess with my sophomore year there I felt relatively settled because like the cliche I like started extracurriculars and I got into theater and so through all of that I felt I felt way more settled mm-hmm. But um, I, I had a I had a really similar similar background. Oh yeah, I didn't move to the U.S. until I got to college. But same thing. That's right. Where you like think? I mean, my dad was Spanish. My mom was American. But I went to international schools and thought I was oh, American. Thought I yeah. was American for a long. Yeah. Time. And then you move and you're like, oh no, <laughs> this is yeah. not. And for me, it happened to me in college. And I went to you know similar experience where I went to like a big school with like football and cheerleaders and like all that type of stuff and I thought it was going to be like the movies and it just was not that it's hard right I think something too like the fact that you you know you went to international school and like something that comes with that is if you then go and like are living in the country of like one of your parents like you did and me it's like then you realize something about I mean college is different but there's something similar where it's like all these people kind of grew up, grew up with each other. And if they didn't literally grow up with each other, they still like grew up around each other, you know, right. like understanding each other. And I think that is hard going into that as someone who was like overseas for whatever family or, you know, whatever, re- or like job related reason. So um, right. do you, are you in touch with any people that you went to international school with? Every day. Oh yeah! Wow. Every day. I mean, we all, we went all the way through high school. So like my yeah. group of girlfriends from my international school, we have a group chat on WhatsApp and we talk every day. And I see that's them really... pre-COVID, we managed to see each other like a couple times a year. Okay, you know, that's incredible. Mostly actually. everybody's like in the Americas. We have like a couple of my friends are in Europe, but like mostly everybody because the school was in Mexico. Mostly everybody's like in the Americas, so we managed to see okay. each other pretty often too. Oh, cool. That is the beauty. Social media is like a big corrupt bag of shit and complication. But I do think that one thing I appreciate about it is that it allows you to connect with and stay in touch with people who you just like were from another walk of your life and you wouldn't see that frequently otherwise. Right. And it's a really unique way to grow up. And those schools are a very unique experience. And I feel like everybody who leaves those schools has that same sort of, sort of like culture shock thing. Yeah. So I think those friends are important to keep forever. Um, yeah, that's so true. I'm so grateful for that. It's really nice too now is like a lot of people have way more time on their hands to connect with people. And right. like, yeah. <laughs> At the same time, I find myself also, not, I don't know. I, I don't know whether I feel... Like, I feel, okay, I'm talking about, like, being busy versus, like, in, like, social versus, like, having way more time on your hands because of COVID. But, um, you know, I think this time and the, our, predic- our, like, pandemic predicament makes us, when we do reach out to people, it's, like, because you really want to, as opposed to just kind of, like, seeing everyone every day that you have to right, know. Right, right, right. That's um, true. There's a purpose to every interaction now that didn't exist necessarily before, you know? Yeah, that's so true. And and I've actually read an article recently saying that's a bad thing, but I don't see that. I mean, they say that incidental encounters with people are what we're missing. And, and I kind of get that, like, not, not from people you're necessarily well acquainted with that say you work a job, maybe you're cool with like the custodian or somebody you say hello to a day or right driver on your route or whatever but i'm like i can leave that you know as long as i don't have to deal with like frenemies and like you know even people in comedy i just straight up have a distaste for (laughs) you know this is this is fine for me um yeah i hear that and one thing i i was thinking about too is that like um in New York, like something that was really helpful for me once I got more settled in New York was that I got hired at this little private school to teach like sixth grade humanities for two months for this class whose teacher was on maternity leave. And then the school hired me to work there full time. And I feel like last year 
And it's been so helpful because once I got that and more, a little bit more stability, like then last year I could just focus on comedy and also had more, I could like go back to DC and like go to different, anyway, it just gave me a lot more like of a, what do you call, like a safety net to live my life. And, and, and uh, because I was really busy last year, I feel like I didn't actually get to know the other teachers that well. I was just kind of like there and like connecting with the kids and my co-teacher, but I always felt a little bit out of touch with the other staff. And I think this year I'm actually getting to know them more as like people and friends. And I guess that's kind of nice. That's awesome. What yeah. what grade do you do you teach? What age kids do you do? Yeah, so it's a bit all, all over the place. Last year I taught preschool full time and it was hard with comedy, but it's okay. I guess I somehow managed the energy. I like it was nice to like when it was nice to just like be with little, little minds all day, you know, even if it was tiring in a different way than comedy. But then this now this semester, I'm essentially a support teacher for like grades one through five. Like it's a small school and the classes are really small because of COVID right now. So mm -hmm. I'm helping out different grades. So I'm like in the, I'm like in the elementary yesterday. We, uh, um, oh, I didn't go in today because I got the second vaccine. Uh, yeah, me too. I'm oh, you like, oh, you did? Wait, yeah. so I'm feeling really low energy because of the side effects. How did you feel, Petey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first day, the pain didn't kick in in my arm until like late at night. And then the next day, I was just like white. So I was yeah. just down drinking water, barely ate that much. Um, body pains in like weird places too, yeah. like fingers and shit. You know, you feel yeah, like an yeah. arthritic old guy or something. It's weird. Right. Um, but, you know, the thing is, the lady that put the needle in my arm told me something smart, which was actually to go move around despite that. And, oh. and especially your arm, whichever one you got the shot in. So it'll feel move it better. around. Yeah. Do some push ups even. You won't feel like <laughs> doing them, but I'm telling you, you'll feel like a little better after the fact. Yeah. I've just been being a little princess and like, I'm like, oh, I can't use that arm to reach for the spatula. But I'm in the throes of that right now i'm so i am apologize if i'm like kind of low energy i just feel weird and my arm hurts and uh like I, I guess i just feel like i was recovering from a fever that i didn't have right yeah sense. yeah that's that's exactly right so do you, guys, do you guys mentally feel like now that you've had the vaccine do you feel like overnight you're like less nervous about it has it changed your mental definitely COVID? Okay, Definitely. I don't know. I haven't even thought about that, which is funny because that's the point. <laughs> but right. for yeah. you, you feel that way, PD? Yeah, I mean, in a way, no, because it doesn't seem like it because I'm double masking now and shit. But that's just because I want to do the civic thing and I still read these articles about new strains and stuff. But nonetheless, I feel like, hey, within these 14 days after that's done, like, I'm going to mask up and go out and do comedy any fucking place I can do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I've totally. done my duty for a year of not doing comedy like that. And now it's time to live a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I hear that. And I really miss, I think the, re okay. I, I think that I have, that hasn't occurred to me so strongly because, because of my job, I'm like with kids all day and like different kids. So we're all masked and, technically social distanced as much as we can really but if for some reason in that capacity nerves around around being around like little groups of people I don't really have them anymore because I just feel kind of was like numbed off or like <laughs> like in September but I really miss traveling for comedy I would go I really miss being coming back and forth from DC and like getting to go to like the draft house and other spaces and and I just haven't at all through this whole time so like that's something that I'm looking forward to is with is being able to more safely travel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So my, I'm still like, I've just been kind of wearing bags of clothes all day and I feel like I should hydrate more. So the fact that you said water makes me, remi reminds me of that. 100%. But, um, oh my God. And my other thought about it is that all the, at this hospital, I feel like all the people in charge of the vaccine, like the people distributing it and stuff are all really, they're all, they're all like crazy and loopy because I think they're just tired. And so, and like overworked. And the first dose, 
there was a younger guy and this older guy and then the young older guy goes like I, I swear it was the younger guy's first time administering it which is like pretty funny to realize as you're about to get this um shot but he, the older guy goes Ali you did it and he like jumped up and down and he said if you weren't a guy, I would hug you right now. And then I was just what? like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then yesterday when I got the second dose, it was a say that same older guy and this woman. And then the woman asked me, um, do you remember the name of the person who gave you the first dose? And I said, I think it was a man named Ali. And the woman said, Muhammad Ali, he's dead. <laughs> oh my god! She's like prepping my my like syringe. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I mean, shout out to their work. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, I'll tell you what. It, it's enough to drive you nuts if you work in healthcare. I mean, I do. Oh, I don't yeah. do any administering of shots or anything. But I live with a lady right now that's a nurse practitioner and. Even the amount of like coworkers, people in the field that won't get this fucking vaccine. Like, are you stupid? You know, like that, and just have to sit around all day giving out shots to people. And you got deniers, Illuminati, whatever nonsense, conspiracy things being talked about. It, and people are dying. Like, yeah. drug been like 14,000 a day the last couple of days in this country. So, I don't know. Wow. Yeah, sorry to bring it down. I didn't mean to. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that's my yeah. fault. I like to, you know, get on rants when somebody brings up a negativistic topic. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, how are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> How's your week? <laughs> I'm great, man. I, I'm in paradise. It's cool where I'm at. Where are you? I'm in Hyattsville right now. Oh, nice, nice. I take care of these dogs for an old colleague, so I stay with her kind of, and that's been for the past year. It's been oh, great. amazing. Okay, yeah, hella work, uh, my job, nice. and just mm -hmm. walk these dogs and try to write jokes and hope the timing's any good when I get back on stage with them. You know? Yes. <laughs> right. What about you, Elena? How's your week? I'm good. You know, it's a lot of, I mom it up, you know, I work from home, yeah. you, know, you know, everything I do is entertainment based, you know, like, like the, my, my day job as it were, is like writing for stuff in Mexico and even right. that's slow. So I'm just, I'm mom it okay. up. Mom um, it up. What's your daughter's name? Sonia. Sonia. And what's Sonia's vibe? Like what's she into? Sonia is extremely energetic extremely oh my gosh. I don't know you you'd be able to tell me if that's normal for her age or not you know like her big thing she's go go is her big word like you know I'm Whoa, like, cool. every, anytime she's eating anything she's like go go like get me out of here I want to like and she just runs you know we're trying we're looking at moving because she just like runs all over our apartment all day oh long. so you, you like you you think that she would like a, like a different kind of space to run around more space i mean my we're at my in-laws a lot and they have a big house out in maryland and we'll go because especially it's winter now so like we'll take her outside some days but she just started walking like maybe three weeks ago and oh my so gosh congratulations like thank you it's just like she won't stop and suddenly our apartment feels really small because she just runs from one um. to the other and um, it's just that's so a lot of energy very girly you know, really into uh -huh. pink stuff, glitter. Hell yeah, power you know, like hair. Oh yeah. I think that is so fascinating because like, I've worked with diff kids in different capacities for, for years, like as I was trying to move forward in comedy. And I think that based on like, based on just being somebody that the kids come to during the day and go home, it must be, I always think that it must be re like really interesting seeing development at home right because you're like oh or like I'm sure it's like just kind of getting through every day and then you realize that now that she's like not only walking but running and like is really empowered and this new tool that she has yes <laughs> that it really makes me wonder about I don't know the human condition and development um the interesting thing about development at this age is they're so young is that it happens so quickly like 
you know, oh, yeah, like rapid. Who she is, like a month from a month ago to now. Like my parents visited three. They actually they came and got the vaccine. They, they oh really? And they came three weeks apart. And they, because they're over sixty five and and they have Medicare, so they they and for the three weeks from when they came last time to when they came to get the vaccine she was like two different people. You know, she wasn't walking the last time she got, they were here, they came back, she was walking. She's, you know, she had way more words than she did three weeks ago, much more interactive conversationally, like two different people in less than a month. That's incredible. Wow. Which is the interesting thing. And I guess when they're this young, that's what happens. It's kind of like every day there's some new thing. And yeah, it must just happen like the increment, like it must, must happen so frequently, like little updates because yeah. um, that's so cool. Humans are wild. They are. <laughs> it's good to be one. Yeah, yeah, we're lucky. That's really, yeah, we seriously are top of the food chain. Um, hey. That's really, <laughs> that's really <laughs> exciting about Sonia. I'm glad to hear she's doing well. Well, we want to thank Brittany for doing this podcast with us. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you for having okay. me. Um, <laughs> I uh, I apologize about my energy. Your energy was great. Nice yeah. to catch up with you both. I didn't even know you had the shot until the last five minutes. Yeah, I think I have the band aid still on. Shit. I okay, yeah. <laughs> three days. That's how much it hurts. It feels like if you take it off, your arm will fall off or something. It really does. It hurts. Anyway. Yeah. Cool. Thanks well, thank you. Me. Great to see you. You're doing good. Thank yes. you, guys. I hope to see you soon in D.C. or anywhere. Randomly in Chicago, Mexico, hey. International School in Mexico, whatever. You let me know, baby. Yeah, comes first. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Bye, guys. Take care. Have a good night. All right. Bye, everybody.